Rebel Executives, the podcast, where everyone has a story about a rebellion. It might be a small risk that ended up shaping the way you do business, or maybe it's the day you rage quit your job and started an empire. Together with other revolutionaries, we'll learn how to grow your business and avoid costly mistakes, because let's face it, none of us got it right the first time. Now, let's join the rebellion with our host, Dawn Sizer. My guest on this episode is a digital marketing executive. He has over 20 years experience working for marketing and advertising agencies where he served as a project manager. He helped to guide multi-million dollar brands toward increased profitability, and he's worked on political campaign marketing by a consortium of the White House Project, the Colorado Department of Education, and the Center for Progressive Leadership. Later, he went on to advise several political campaigns. He's written for Time Warner, spoken at Microsoft, taught social media marketing at Johnson & Wales University, and taught workshops for WordPress Foundation, and is the author of The Road to Digital Marketing Profits. Please welcome David Summerfly. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. I appreciate the time of uh, those out there listening or watching. So tell us a little bit about yourself, because I'm looking, I, I get to actually see his living room, essentially, and I'm seeing a picture of the Dalai Lama behind you. Yes. Yeah, that, that was, um, I, I like to binge read. So I wanted to read every book that uh, the Dalai Lama wrote or co-wrote. Um, so I wanted to read every book. And I, I, I did. I read through uh, as many as I could get my hands on. And one day I just thought, you know what, let me send an email to the Dalai Lama and see what happens. It's got to be possible. So I found the office of the uh, government of uh, Dharamsala, India, and found a way to get in touch. And I just said, hey, you know, I, I, I've read, you know, every book I could get my hands on by the Dalai Lama. I'd really love it if I could get an autographed photo for my office. Um, it would really mean something to me as someone who tries to be ethical and, and moral. Would that be possible? And so I sent the email. And then like six months later, I went to the mailbox and got a very lovely silk uh, envelope with a silk um, card, I guess, or another envelope within the envelope that was also silk with the logo of the government on it. And then the autograph photo of the Dalai Lama just posing for the photo, <laughs> you know, with the signature <laughs> on it. So I remember telling my wife, I said, look, if they can uh, spend $15 in postage to send me this autograph photo, the least I could do is go to the dollar store and get a nice frame for it. Or maybe I actually, I probably went to someplace a little bit nicer and got a frame for it. Well, it so, looks very nice on your wall. Thank you. I look at it and uh, the picture of Buddha that's right next to it. I try to, you know, I put those up to try to remind myself, you know, to always be calm and remember the center. Which is a very hard thing to do sometimes, especially when you're in, you know, the technological world that runs at yes. the speed of sound almost most days. So it, having something to, to focus on is really kind of nice. And I know you've been doing uh, marketing in itself for 20 some years at this point, And I can imagine yeah. you have the horror stories to tell the same way that we do in the IT world. But what I would like to kind of dive into a little bit is digital marketing itself. I mean, as a business owner, we've all had to deal with the thought of, oh, I need to build a website. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to do that. How do I drive traffic? What, you right. know, where do I go with social medias? But I mean, where's it? As a business owner, we all have a website. It probably sucks. Where do we start at that point? You're like, yeah, I, I really need to refresh this thing. Now what? Well, uh, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with that. But basically, <laughs> Statistically speaking, not every business owner has a website, even in 2021, even with COVID-19 running roughshod, you know, through the governments of just about, I don't even know where it's not running roughshod through the government, except maybe in New Zealand. Um, so every business should be online in a very serious, committed way, but many still are not. Uh, statistically, most most small businesses were not online, and um, I c 
could only imagine that, you know, that number probably hasn't changed as, you know, COVID-19 was not expected, nor was it anticipated by most uh, business owners. So ideally, the way to proceed with digital marketing is to I first and foremost have a very deliberate, organized, structured business plan that includes digital marketing in it. So what is digital marketing? Isn't that just online marketing? Well, no, not exactly. To me, digital marketing includes SEO, content marketing, design elements, e-commerce so you can take payments most websites don't have e-commerce and i always say to business owners what is it about money that you don't like i don't understand it you like money (laughs) you need money you need to pay your mortgage or your rent right so why would you want to have a website that could process payments for your services or whatever it is that you do and yet most don't if you're a lawyer a doctor an accountant a, a psychologist Whatever it is you do, you have to get paid. Shouldn't I be able to pay you through your company website? But most don't have that. So it, it's very surprising. Um, and people want it. And right, and, and to be quite honest with you, they need it. They need it right now. They needed it yesterday. So it's very important. I'm very empathic uh, to the needs of the struggling business owner. Um, I had a podcast called... Um, Blue Monday, where the idea was to work with struggling business owners, and I would literally help them live and record whatever we talked about. And sometimes the conversations would be two hours long, where I would diagnose the issues and then tell them what to do to proceed and turn their business around if they were interested in doing it. So it's brutal out there now, much more so than it was a year ago, or even, you know, yeah, a year ago, because I think we're heading into nine months now. Yeah, it, it feels like it's been the longest forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what should they do before you think about, I need a website? Is it, you don't want to look at it as I'm checking an item off of my to-do list, because this is your public-facing online representation of your business. So you want to look like a serious competitor. Now, granted, not everybody is great at this and you don't need to be. I'm not the greatest designer in the world. I'm probably better than most web developers and I should be given what I've done. But I'm not the Pablo Picasso of design. I'm good at putting the whole picture together. And so what most businesses need to do first before just jumping in is to have a deliberate organized structure so that they know first who are your ideal consumers and why, where do they live online? Where do they live offline? What do they, what do they consume? Who are your competitors? Why are these people your competitors? What do they do that you like? What do they do you don't like? What do they do that you could do better? that you could capitalize on and find some marketing vulnerability there that you could exploit somehow, obviously in an ethical manner. So these are all things that you want to look at before you jump in. Is there a good way to figure out where people kind of live online and offline? Um, There are multiple, multiple ways. And I, I didn't want to really plug my book, but my book, The Road to Digital Marketing Profits, I can't reach it over here, I'd show it to you. Um, available at Walmart and Books A Million and Barnes and Noble and Amazon. But it's basically, at the end of it, we walk you through a business plan that you could take with you to a credit union or a bank and say, look, here's my business plan. It encompasses digital marketing now. So how do you find out who, where your ideal consumers live online and offline. That kind of goes into it. The book delves into that. But what you want to do is research who your larger, more profitable competitors are first. And then look at how do they market themselves online? What what resources do they use? What do they look like on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn? How do they represent themselves? And by studying what they do, 
which is what we used to call piggybacking in marketing, by studying what they do and really going through the RSS feeds, following them every day for a week or two and just saying, what do they produce? What type of content do they produce? You'll learn an awful lot. And that's, that's one way to start. Now, any competent digital marketer should be able to tell you, yes, Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner, there are many websites or tools that we could use to gather what's called a competitive intelligence, competitive media analysis, uh, which is uh, just simply a way of studying your competitors to find out, you know, what are they doing that you're not doing? What are they spending on advertising? So you can learn what would be realistic for you. And that's a whole other subject altogether when we talk about budgets for advertising and PPC and investing for growth. So I hope that kind of answers the question in a roundabout way. It, it does. I mean, there is, I mean, when you broke it down, it's a whole lot of, you know, figure out what your competitor's doing, copy it and do it better. Right. But obviously, <laughs> right. we want to say, obviously, don't copy it so that you can be sued into oblivion. You want to do it in an ethical and moral way, but also not do anything that could be illegal. Sure. The reason to study competitors is so that you can try to get a competitive stance. For example, when I was in between marketing agency positions, I worked as a freelancer. I was an independent consultant. I had a small LLC. I was a mobile agency, basically, like the military SEAL team unit. That's how I saw myself. And there was a period where I was number one in Google for uh, digital marketing agencies in the Denver, Colorado area. And I was able to do that by looking at competitors and seeing what they were doing and how they were doing it, but also looking for vulnerabilities in terms of what was it that they weren't doing that I could do. And one of the things I noticed was they were not changing their company websites on a consistent basis. They weren't updating the content. They weren't blogging on a daily basis. They weren't making video content on a daily basis. And I could. They, they weren't in the local community, which I could be. So I decided I was going to exploit those vulnerabilities. And that's essentially what brought me to number one in Google for a few weeks. So and that's, you, that period was very important. So sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. You mentioned video content, and I think that's a really good spot to concentrate here for just a couple of minutes at least. How important is video content? Because I've read a gazillion things that says it's yeah. really, really important. It's like the most important thing. Um, you know, the best thing you can do for your business is to create video content, so on and so forth. And I look at that and think, oh, I, the last thing I want to do is be on camera. Well, you're on camera now. I'm on I, camera. And I'm not exactly true. Brad Pitt. I mean, you know, although my wife would probably disagree, but, um, you know, it, 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 I would not say video content is the most important thing. Let's put it in context. Uh, SEO, which is how you outrank competitors online. Very simple terms. Uh, Google as well put together as it is, at the end of the day, is a giant automated search engine. It's a big giant eye that basically scans the internet 24 hours a day and is looking for content that it can grab onto an index. By default, it was always made to look for, for written textual content first. Now, the number two search engine in the world is YouTube. And so more, more and more people are using YouTube to, to do searches because they want to see visual video answers to their questions. And studies, um, research, I should say, conducted by Google have shown that websites that have connecting SEO to their videos on the first page of their company websites achieve a higher ranking in Google search results. Now, the same is true 
uh, and probably truer if you have a listing on Google My Business. Now, not every business is local. I'm not a local business. I don't really want to be a local business. Uh, so, you know, the more you combine and tie all of these together as a whole, the better you will perform in SEO rankings, if that makes sense. So that's why I say to look at, is video important? Absolutely. It's not number one, though. So what you want to do ideally is have well-written, intelligent, articulate um, content that speaks to the pain points of your ideal consumer. And you want to have video content that complements that that is slightly different so it can be differentiated from the blog post and the podcast and the infographics and so on, but they have complementary or overlapping or maybe even the same SEO terms. So I'll give you a good example if you want me to. Sure. Okay. So um, let's see, what city are you in? I am right near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. So let's say that you own an Italian restaurant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and you want to rank number one in Google for um, let's to be really specific, uh, excuse me specific here. Let's make it even easier. So let's say you're here, you're Harrisburg, Pennsylvania pizza pizzeria pizza joint. All right, you want to be number one in Google for that. Well, what you would do is first of all, your SEO should be the city and state and then a up and down slash, and then the name of your business. So Harrisburg PA pizza slash name of the Italian restaurant, Bob's Pizza Joint, whatever you want to call it. Then you would be listed in Google My Business in that city, in that state, with a matching business name that basically serves, um, addresses what it is that you do. And then uh, have a video commercial. And what SEO title should you have for your video? City, state, up, down, line, name of your pizza joint. It's that simple, but I can't twist the arm of the business owner and make them all do that. But those who are competitive do that. And that's where it becomes more difficult when it's when there's when you're in a larger, more competitive market and you have multiple businesses doing it. I remember I went to go give a um, a, a talk. I was going to go participate in a, a seminar uh, at a local law firm. So I was really excited to go because I had never given a presentation to all lawyers at a law firm. I was a mediator for a while, so I felt very comfortable around them. And I knew that they were going to have good food, which is important. So I went anyway. And um, I remember jumping in the car and getting ready to go. I look them up in Google Maps. They're not there. Oh, geez. That's what I said. And um, I took a deep breath and I said, they're not listed in Google My Business. So guess what? They are not listed in Google Maps because the two tie together. And I'm sure at that point at, you're also thinking, and they're a perfect client. I'll just figure out a way to pitch this on my way there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was getting to the point where I didn't know if I really cared or not, honestly, because I'm, I kind of retired about three years ago. I don't, I, I kind of reached a point where I don't really chase after clients anymore. Thank God. But, um, I did mention it to him, obviously, when I got there. Um, but yeah, I had to really, I had to basically call them because I couldn't find their directions in the GPS. They were invisible to GPS. They didn't have an interactive map on their site. They didn't even list their address on the site. Um, it was impossible to find them. So I had to take out my phone and call them and just hope that I could reach somebody before going to the, you know, to go to speak. Luckily, I had the number for one of the organizers and just said, hey, I'm coming to speak at your event, but I can't find your office. Oh, geez. 
Isn't and that it, crazy? It is. And I think that ties in a little bit, too. I mean, if you couldn't find them on the web, you couldn't find them on Google, usually you can then find them on some type of social media at that point. So you then would you would hope. You would hope that that would be a thing. Obviously, it wasn't in yeah. your case. But yeah. I, I think that's the next part of, of the, the puzzle here is, you know, how important is social media marketing in all of all of yeah. this? Well, if, if we look at the law firm that I spoke at, when I Googled the name of the law firm, their social media would have come up. If they had any. Right. And it didn't. <laughs> I mean, I have a funny last name and I know it. Right. So if you Google my name, what's going to come up? My social media presence, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, YouTube you know, the different videos and so on. So how important is social media? Um, it's important, but it's only important after you know who you are and why you are as a business first. So, you know, if people say to me, well, well David, you don't take your own advice. I'm not the same guy. You know, I know these things, but I don't necessarily practice them because I'm basically in a place where I'm retired. I don't know who, if I really want to, if a client contacts me and they're committed, I'll work with them. If they contact me and they're apathetic, I'm not going to work with them. Whereas if you had asked me two or three years ago, I might try to convince you. But um, social media is important to the business that wants more leads wants to expand into new markets and is committed and serious about it. They're willing to do whatever it takes to grow that business and solidify their base and take care of their family members, pay their mortgage, pay the rent. If you're in that position and you're committed, you're willing to do just about anything. Okay. And, and that's very serious to me because um, you know, I know what it's like when I was in between agency jobs and I was trying to run my own LLC agency. There were times when it was very close. I didn't know if we were going to be able to pay the mortgage uh, that month. And then there were other months where I said, we've got enough tucked away. We're good for several months now. And then you go work at the agency. And after you do that for a while, you know, you, you hopefully you learn. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been there <laughs> when I started the business. I remember what that was like, and you were willing to do pretty much anything that you could to pay the bills. Yeah, yep, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, right. and 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 um, another great tip that's related that I'll just add. One of the ways that I was able to get to number one in Google for local uh, businesses when I was in Denver, and one of the ways I was able to pay the rent or the mortgage in one day, was by doing seminars or workshops. And I would usually do them on weekends. If there was a holiday coming up, I would do it on a holiday weekend because you'd get even more people attending. And I would charge anywhere from 100 to $200 per person. If it was an all-day boot camp, obviously I would charge more because they'd take me out on a stretcher at the end of the day. you know. But it was so labor intensive, I felt very, very justified and the value is there. But you could easily get a lot of referrals and and cover yourself fairly well by doing that. And it helps your SEO if you promote it through your blogging and your social media, record the video, and then take the video, cut it into smaller segments. Now you can repurpose those. Yeah, that's always great when you can take a video that you already have or a piece of whatever it is. You know, we've done that for um, one of the events that we did and we cut it into little pieces and we're able to, you know, reuse it <laughs> ad infinitum almost. So that yeah, worked out I really was, well. Yeah, I was on one podcast. Um, I think the winning e-commerce. I can't remember the, the winning e-commerce experience, I think it was. And the guy did a brilliant job of taking the interview and cutting it into four or five segments. So now he's got four or five blog posts he could write about it where he could transcribe it, four or five mini podcasts. Now he's got four or five videos and he can circulate all of that content over and over again every 90 days or so, change the SEO around 
Now you've got that. And if I want to, I can piggyback on that, change the hashtags around, change the descriptions around and use that same content. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about what digital marketing is and what the different pieces parts are for it and sure. kind of how you should get started and, and get moving with it. But what are we actually doing with it besides creating a website and throwing some money at marketing? I mean, we want to make sure right. that we're actually solving a problem that the business has. Right. That's the ideal. Uh, it's not what most businesses do. So you're running against the, against the tide. But that's the ideal scenario. And um I could give you one or two examples if you want. Yeah, if we can do it, I think usually this works better when you can say, you know, this is how Bob went about it. And, you know, in, in Bob's scenario here, this is what he was trying to accomplish and, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So tell us about Bob and what is he trying to accomplish and how are we going to do it? Okay, I'll give you one example. I don't want to name the, the exact specific business, but I'll tell you what I did uh, with them. So basically, I was a customer and um, we just got into a conversation. They said, uh, do you know, you know, by the way, you know, they we knew each other. You know, I had been to their business several times. So we, we had had several conversations. We talked about what I did and my experience. So one day, one of the owners said to me, well, what do you know about this web stuff? And I said, okay, could you be a little bit more specific? What do you mean? So we talked, then we scheduled a, a consultation strategy call. We talked and everything. So basically what we did was a needs, what I call a needs analysis or a diagnosis. Like you go to the doctor, tell me where it hurts. What have you done to try to treat the pain? Did you use heat? Did you use cold? Did you apply pressure? Did you take anything? How long has this been going on? Who else is involved? Where did this happen? And so on. So I talked to them at length. It was probably two or three uh, brief conversations that we either did in person or by video uh, or over the phone. And so we diagnosed the issues and they said, well, we need a website because we have so many customers who want us to have a website, their brick and mortar business. And they make, they make pretty good money. They do pretty well, but people were coming in and saying, we, we can't find you in Google. We want to look up your hours. We can't find them. We want to email you. We can't. Uh, what do we do? And they had tried working with several local hobbyists. They had worked with people from Craigslist and Fiverr. And of course, nothing came to the way that they wanted it. They had tried doing it themselves using Wix and Weebly and so on. And it, it didn't work out. Big surprise. So I told them, make a list of everything that you would like to have in a dream world. If you could wave the magic wand and make it happen, what would you like to really make your life easier as well as, you know, other things? Well, we want to be number one in Google. Okay, that's good. Uh, we want to be, you know, the more I talk to them, the more we could diagnose problems. So basically what we ended up doing at, I think it, it was somewhere between 30 and 60 days. Because the majority of the time that I spend talking to a client is what I call discovery. Once I start working, I don't want to be messed with. I want to get it done quickly so that we can move very quickly and get things done rapidly. Um, so what they ended up with was a website that basically automated their email responses because they would get emails all the time from their customers about product and service inquiries. So we wanted to automate that using a different suite of tools. And I check it every once in a while as part of our ongoing maintenance plan. But so we automated their email. We have an interactive map, so they shouldn't have to give any more directions. It's a waste of time. It's on the company website. Um, they have a very interactive contact form, so they shouldn't have to answer the phone. There's no need to. It blocks out spam very effectively. And if there's a problem, I told them, call me, and I'll remove the problem very quickly. Um, 
So we automated that. We took all the bookkeeping and moved it to a secure cloud storage and did what we could with the accountant to automate as much of the bookkeeping as possible. They wanted to be able to bid on government contracts, which if you get one government contract, you're talking at the minimal, maybe 20, 30 grand. So if you get one government contract, you're going to make back whatever you paid me and then some. And if you get two or three government contracts over the course of one year, I mean, you quadrupled whatever you paid me. Right, so I'm I mean, more than justified it. Right. Sure. Just in the time and, that they're not answering the phones and not answering emails, they've paid for Right. You. Right. And uh, I registered them with Google My Business. So now even if you don't see the company website, you're going to see them listed in Google under their business. They're registered with Google Maps. They're registered on Yelp, LinkedIn. I did all of that as well. Rebel Executives is presented by Third Element Consulting. If you want to consider your IT solved, find us at thirdelementconsulting.com. So they were on the first page of Google. I took a screenshot of it for them so that both of the owners could see it because Google changes their algorithms. So what one person may see as number one in Google, another person in another city or another time might not. So I wanted that screenshot and I also knew I would want to brag about it in the future. So um, yeah, they were able to grow exponentially and I'm very proud of that. And um, they're still getting government contracts. They're still getting government solicitations. They're actually getting emails from new uh, clients on a daily basis who tell them, we found you on Google, Yahoo, or Bing, and we want to do business with you as a direct result of that. So if you were to ask them, how much money did you make from working with David? They'd probably say, well, we have no idea. You know, all we know is we got umpteenth number of you know, government contracts, uh, you know, we've gotten probably 20 new customers per month since we began, you know, this process. And um, they got a good, they got a good deal. Yeah, but that is a really good point. I mean, how do you figure out what your return on investment is with marketing? I mean, it's really difficult to figure that out. It is. And um, that's why yeah, and, and and honestly, I didn't cover all of the bases that could be automated through a company website. Like, there's human resources. I mean, you could log into the company site and download all your HR forms and do a signature through it and do um, uh, training and uh, all kinds of other things as well, the book, booking schedules and, and so on. But how do you figure out if your company website is giving you return on investment ROI? It's it's sticky because that depends on the individual business. And what we usually ask you for are what's called KPIs or key performance indicators. You have you have to work that out with whoever it is that you work for. So one of the most integral questions I ask a potential client is how do we define success? And a lot of small business owners will struggle with that question because nobody had ever asked them that before, or they, maybe they never gave it much thought. Um, so when I ask them that, I need to break that down into specifics. What does that look like for you? And then we look at that and then we determine, is that realistic? You know, if you're, if you have a gym, your success may be a 10% increase in uh, memberships. Uh, within 90 days. So we would look at that and say, well, how realistic is that given your market nationally and then locally? Look at your competitors. Is that a, you know, let us diagnose that KPI and see if that's realistic, period. You know, but for a lot of businesses, in, you know, in increasing uh, one specific metric or KPI 
can bring in thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. If you have a furniture warehouse, for example, there was a furniture warehouse I worked with. If you increase your website conversions by 3%, that's good. Because I mean, if you sell one overpriced coach, you're you're not going to make what you invested for me. That's true. But let's say that you sell an entire living room. Yeah, you're probably going to make back what you invested with me. And if you do that two or three times, then obviously you're going to. If it's a car dealership, you sell one car, you're, you know, you're going to make back whatever you would spend. So it's a no brainer. If you're an accountant or lawyer, you know, you're, if you get one new lead, you just made back what you spent. Yeah, exactly. It went, I mean, and a lot of it too, is just a matter of like, what were you looking to accomplish? You know, if you know what you're looking to accomplish, then you can start right. to assign those, you know, the KPIs to it. And okay, so now I know what I'm tracking, what I'm looking for. I mean, for us, we track things like um, we get little surveys back from our, our ticket responses. You know, was it speedy enough? Was it, you know, this? Was it that? These are the things that we're looking at to track. And then I know too, you know, if I've spent five thousand dollars on something. I want to know what I was going to accomplish with that $5,000, right. what I want to track for that $5,000. Did I hit the mark where I wanted? Did I get a client out of it? Did I get this? Did I, you know, and you right. keep going down that little funnel of things that you want to make sure that you're actually getting for your money and knowing that upfront helps with the spend too. Right. And if, and if, if we take what you were just saying, if you didn't get back, the ROI that you had anticipated or had hoped for, well, then the next question becomes why? You, right. So One, why, why did you do it? But why didn't it work? Right. And if, if the person on the other says, if the other end says, well, we did it because you told me to, uh-uh, that's not the way it works. The person placing the ads, for, if we just talk about ads, PPC, pay-per-click, if we just talk about online advertising as one example, with Facebook, Google Ads, LinkedIn, Twitter advertising, Pinterest advertising, a lot of these companies change their algorithms. They change the way that they do things on a fairly regular basis. So it can be difficult for them to to really explain some of these KPIs sometime or sometimes or why something didn't perform as, as we had hoped. And what you do is you usually budget for 90 days. And every 90 days you, you, you pause, you do a reassessment. If it, if business is booming, you look at your KPIs, you look at where you're performing well, what did well, what didn't. You look at the, the scope of the project. And if you're not getting the results that you had wanted, then after 90 days, you pause and you reassess like you're going into a huddle and you kind of reassess uh, what, what didn't work and why. And, and, you know, I should say, when we applied these um, desired outcomes, to online marketing and online advertising, it's very important to look at it in context. You know, a couple of years ago, we would spend, uh, what, three to $5,000 to put an ad in a newspaper, and you'd be lucky if it ran for several months. The newspaper could never guarantee you results, never. And they wouldn't do it because they can't guarantee who's going to call you and who won't. So here you are investing several grand to put an ad in the newspaper. You may or may not get the phone calls you wanted. And once you stop spending the money, it's over. Whatever calls you might get, stop. The same is true for billboards, putting ads on the side of buses, which is wildly expensive. Same is true for these billboards. The yellow pages, I know one company told me they spent three grand a month putting ads in the yellow pages. I said, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, do they but they do it. Those? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And you know, I, I have one around here somewhere I used to reach into the cabinet, but, um, my point is they can't guarantee you results and people are, most business owners never think to try to hold them accountable. How do you do that? But for the same amount of money, you can actually be online with a professional 
responsive e you know e-commerce you know beautiful custom site that's plugged into google that you know does everything you want it to do for about that same price for most businesses and after it's created that's it you don't have to keep spending that same amount of money every month yeah you want to maintain it but it's nowhere near what the initial uh, investment was all right then it's just a matter of keeping up with you know content creation and making sure right. that everything is linked properly and that you know other people are looking at it and so on and so forth i mean there are right. so many moving parts inside of digital marketing that I think we should probably touch on them all one more time. So let's do that. So we talked about SEO. So explain SEO just a little bit, because I, I refer to it as like black magic for the most part, or at least it seems like it. But I mean, that search engine optimization thing, figuring out what terms to use and how to do it, mm. but you broke it down into something that was incredibly simple. So do that again. Yeah. Search engine optimization is SEO. It's how you outrank competitors online. Yeah. And you said it was a whole lot of like you take your your city that you're in, the state that you're in, yeah. the pipe symbol, which is that <laughs> up and down line, and your business name. Like, there you have it. Make sure right. that that's in there. I blog about this stuff on Twitter. I write about it on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. I've done videos about it. For some reason, people don't don't understand it or they just won't do it. Um, or maybe they get these free do it yourself or templates and they don't know how to do it, but that's why you hire somebody to go do it for you. You know, I remember there's that famous story of somebody, uh, Thomas Edison hired somebody to come and fix some part of their factory or something. And the guy charged him like $30,000, which back then was a fortune and Edison balked at it. So how can you, how can you, you know, justify this amount of money? And the guy gave him a receipt and it said hours spent diagnosing issue. It was like 30 hours, hours solving problem one. He knew where to find the key problem in changing out this one thing that none of the other engineers knew. So he was worth the money because he solved this, you know, million dollar problem right. for it them. It solves the issue. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So yeah, if SEO is very simple, if you're local, if you're a local business and you live in a relatively non-competitive environment, it's it's really not that big a deal. You have city, comma, state, then the up down symbol, whatever the hell you want to call that, then the name of your business. It ain't rocket science. That will help you get to uh, uh, the point where you can potentially outrank your competitors. Now. The tighter your market is, the more competitive your, your market is, the harder it will be. If you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, if you're a restaurant, that's even easier for you because now you can compartmentalize. You, In other words, you could be much more specific. You can say, you know, for a lawyer, they, they're not all lawyers. You're, uh, what do they call it? Advocacy law. There's uh, tax law. It's There's state corporate planning. Law. You, yeah, you right. Name it. yeah. Right, right, exactly. So you have all these different types of legal practice. You have so many different types of restaurants. You have different types of accountants, different types of realtors. So if you do city, comma, state, the up and down line, the name of your business, you're probably going to do pretty well. Now, if you do city, state, up, down, the type of business that you do, now you're talking even greater specificity. And you don't necessarily have to have that up down symbol. There are websites that don't use that. There are ones that do things a little bit differently. And I'll tell you a great example of this. If anybody wants to see this in practice, um, this is not local though. So if you go to politico.com, which as a former journalist, I look at often, Politico.com, you take your cursor, you hover it over the little tab, whatever you want to call it, and you will see they're telling Google, this is what we want to be known for. When people type in politics or political news, we want them to come to our website. That's the purpose of SEO. That's what that tab is for. 
you know? So when you look at a business, you put the tab or uh, the cursor rather over that tab, what you see is what you're telling Google, I want to be indexed for. So if you go to my website, you put the tab, the, the cursor over my tab, it says digital marketing solutions, then the company name. Now, is that ideal for me? Well, maybe, maybe not. I'm not local. I don't compete locally because I live in a relatively small area, but I'm also kind of semi-retired. I still working with, I still enjoy working with clients, but I'm not going crazy over it. If I wanted to be local, what I would do ideally, and I'm giving you a long-winded answer to a short question, so cut me off at any time. If I, <laughs> if I really wanted to get down and dirty with this, what I would do is I would pick a local domain name, okay? Like, um, well, let me see, Brooklyn, New York. So I would do BrooklynNYPizzeria.com. Um, I would get that domain name. That would be my SEO. That's yeah, what I that, would block. That makes it easy. Right. Now, if Brooklyn, and, and I'm from New York, but I don't know, Brooklyn probably has a lot of neighborhoods or boroughs. And it's probably very, very competitive. So then you would want to focus in on your neighborhood, your specific neighborhood and zip code, because it's even more competitive there. Yeah, they might have a couple of pizza, your pizza places there. I think you're right. So, yeah. <laughs> so we would make it hi- what's called hyper local. So we would do neighborhood, city, state, and uh, then we would blog about it. We would have recipe videos where we used, we talked about our city, uh, our, you know, our neighborhood within the city, within the state, and you would have local events. There's so much you can do now, even with, even with a, a pandemic raging, there's still so much you can do to market and promote a business if the will is there. Yeah, I mean, I I literally just had this conversation with our marketing group today and they were saying the exact same thing. So, I mean, you are absolutely dead on. Like, make sure that you're talking about where you are and what you do and putting that into your SEO and it will help. Absolutely. So I am going to go back through everything that we talked about because we talked about a lot of stuff. Um we talked all about, you know, how to demystify this this digital marketing that a lot of people are just starting to dip their toes in after, you know, COVID is hit and we're all online at this point. But there are still a big number and a big percentage of small businesses that are not online yet, which is amazing to me. Um, being in the, you know, tech field, it's just it's mind boggling. Um, you do need to get a business plan together with your digital marketing. You need to figure out where it is that you're going with it before you start doing it. And make sure that you put an e-commerce section, even if it's just to pay, you know, the bills that you have out to your clients or, you know, the other folks there. Give them an easy way to pay you. Get your cash, you know, when you can. Look at, at your competitors. Take a look at what they're doing. And we don't want to copy them because that's that's not quite what we want to do, but we want to mimic what they're doing and do it a little bit better. So figure out kind of what 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 they have going on and, and see if you can't do it a little bit better. And also try to figure out what it is that they're spending, because that'll kind of give you an idea of what you should be spending as well. And then video content, we talked a little bit about how important it really is. And the truth of the matter is, is that Google is still number one. It's still the number one search engine out there. But YouTube is number two. So video is important. It's not quite as important as Google. So we still want to make sure that we are uh, optimizing for that. But you definitely want to have some video content. Get it on YouTube. Get it you know, working together with your social media. Get it working with your website. And make sure that it's SEO'd as well. Make sure, too, that you have your Google My Business set up and set to you. Um, and then take a look at your you know, seminars and workshops and boot camps and everything that you can possibly do to get some lead generation going. You can use that website for that. The other thing you want to take a look at is when you are putting together your whole digital marketing strategy, make sure that you're actually solving a business issue. It's great that you're going to put together a website. It's great that you're going to do all this stuff, but you're not, if you're not actually solving a business issue, it's kind of silly. So make yourself a list of all the things that you want to accomplish. And then build digital and technological solutions that will actually help you solve those issues. Once you do that, 
And the next thing you're going to want to take a look at is, okay, I'm going to spend all this money on all these really cool things that I want to be able to do. So what's my ROI and how do I figure this out? Well, the best thing I can tell you to do is think of yourself, your business owner self, and you're out on a desert island. And if you could think about 10 to 15 things that you would need to know to figure out how your business is running at any given time, those are your KPIs. Those are your key performance indicators. That's what would tell you exactly how your business is doing. So again, think about yourself, desert island, you're on vacation, but if you had to make that one phone call and figure out, you know, how my business was doing, what 10 to 15 questions could you ask somebody and they would give you those answers and you would know, oh, I have to leave the desert island or I can stay here another week. So those are your KPIs. It's what matters to you and your business. And then also think about some of the things that you'd be willing to pay per click for. What types of terms that you'd want to be able to use, what you'd be willing to do, and how much that you'd be willing to pay for every single lead that would click there. And I think that sums it up. Did I miss anything? No, I think that's pretty good. Thanks for listening to Rebel Executives with Don Sizer, the podcast that gives you an edge over traditional business thinking and helps grow your business without making costly mistakes. You can join the other rebels taking the steps to become more effective leaders at rebelexecutives.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, long live the revolution. The revolution. The revolution.